So we've already touched base on a lot of things. We talked about the liver making bile salts. We talked about pancreatic secretion. You need pancreas and you need enterocytes. So these are the key components in fat absorption and we understand that. All right, so you have to be familiar with the diseases, great test fodder, the description of fat malabsorption, i.e. steatorrhea, that's not hard. And what are the clinical stigmata? What are the manifestations? That's where it all goes. The fat malabsorption gateway symptom to these. All right, so first let's just start with the symptom, steatorrhea, I call it a gateway symptom. How are they gonna describe it? Foul smelling, oily, stool that floats. That's how they teach us, that's how they taught me. I see them use the phrase bulky stool. Somehow bulky stool is supposed to mean steatorrhea, right? Because they don't wanna say foul smelling, oily stool that floats, because that's easy. Next thing is you can go on ahead and stain the stool for that. So it's Sudan black or Sudan red stain will actually find, and, and they'll ask you, what is it staining for? It's fat globules in the stool. It's actual triglycerides. What are those fat globules? The triglycerides, you gotta think about that. Otherwise, well, what is it? That's what it is. So you can get a qualitative stool smear for Sudan black. If it turns out there's fat globules in the stool, ultimately down the road, you can talk about a quantitative collection of stool. That's down the road, we'll get to that, all right? So that's steatorrhea as the gateway symptom, however they describe it. And the derivatives I already told you had to do with fat soluble vitamins, organ physiology, et cetera. All right, so let's now, again, we're still absorbing fats. Let's, let's go to the hepatocyte. And you see, I have listed your primary bile acids, cholic acid, kenodeoxy, uh, cholic acid, primary bile acids, secondary bile acids. Again, I just don't see them as important. Uh, what is important here is how we make bile acids, bile salts. And the first step, right, is conversion of cholesterol to bile acid. And I, I, are you guys aware of this? I mean, this thing right here, this cholesterol bile acid, that's how we get rid of cholesterol. Do you guys know that, right? We all know about the LDL receptor taking cholesterol in the body, but how does the liver get rid of it? It makes bile acids, that's great stuff. You can secrete cholesterol di uh, directly into the biliary canaliculi, that's minor, that's not how we do it. It's by the uh, synthesis of bile acids. And what's the key step there is 7-alpha hydroxylase. Now, I don't see them asking you much about 7-alpha hydroxylase, it's often just a distractor in questions where they're asking about enzymes, but you have to be aware of 7-alpha hydroxylase in this role because it ultimately matters. Because if you inhibit that enzyme, right, which drug accomplishes this as an adverse effect? Who inhibits 7-alpha hydroxylase? Fibrates, fibrates. Because you know the language of fibrates, their side effect is gonna be cholelithiasis. Fibrates, you know, what's the adverse effect? If you had to pick one, it's cholelithiasis. That's memorization, we don't do it. Why does it cause cholelithiasis? Well, it inhibits 7-alpha uh, hydroxylase. Ah, we're not getting bile acids made. We're not getting bile acids. We can't get rid of cholesterol. And it brings us to this damn thing here, that lithogenesis curve up top. And now we're talking about decreased bile salts and increased cholesterol, supersaturation. That's your stones associated with fibrates and stones in general. <laughs> Graphics that matter. We'll cover this during liver. We'll Got some more to say about bile, but this phase diagram is not going away for you. So you can increase cholesterol, like pregnancy, estrogen will increase cholesterol, high HDL return to the liver. But the other way you can get there is decreased bile as we're talking about now. So bile acid, we had cholesterol, 7-alpha hydroxylase, bile acid, and then it just becomes this nomenclature about the primary acids, secondary acids. So the primary acids are gonna get conjugated to bile salts, secondary acids deconjugated, bile salts become the secondary acids. Conjugation, what's the point of conjugation is just to make bile salts, right? Bile acids are insoluble, bile salts are soluble. All right, so here's another classic drawing. So we have a hepatocyte, we have the common bile duct, we have the cystic duct. So the accretions come out to the small intestine and again, bile salts, initially colic acid, bile acids, become deconjugated into that form. We said that already. Here's just, again, more enteropathic circulation. We're getting into the disease where we're going. Uh, they get reabsorbed and deconjugated. We just talked about this already, right? So let's look at the conditions here. So primary biliary cirrhosis, or called biliary cholangitis, failure of bile salts to get into the gut or out of the liver. And so when I'm listing here, we're talking about fat-soluble vitamins in general, but most typically what you're gonna see in the, the patient I'm talking about here, primary biliary cirrhosis, this is where they seem to bury the vitamin A derivatives. We'll talk about vitamin A, but vitamin A derivatives seem to be with primary biliary cirrhosis. It can be with any form of steatorrhea, but that's where they seem to bury it. 
Um, and, and you hear the term primary biliary cirrhosis. Well, the secondary biliary cirrhosis, what's that? I.e. cystic fibrosis, where the liver becomes damaged. The biliary ducts get damaged because the secretions, again, become inspissated, right? So that's secondary biliary cirrhosis, just to make the distinction. As far as cirrhosis in general and or obstruction, right? You'd say, oh, what if I have an obstruction? Mass at the head of the pancreas. Shouldn't I get steatorrhea? Sure. You know, they, they have other issues. Te technically, should it cause steatorrhea? Sure. Cirrhosis, should they have diarrhea? Yeah, from lactulose, right? You're doing that to treat their encephalopathy. Uh, but technically, if they're not making bile salts, they would have uh, diarrhea as well. And then lastly, the big one for, we're talking still about enterophatic circulation of um, the bile salts, is really, it's surgical resection. It is Crohn's disease. And again, just remember how they do it. 16-year-old, recurrent abdominal pain, and oily stool, right? That, that's, that's Crohn's. They're just telling you, steatorrhea, with belly pain, and I'm young, I have Crohn's, and then they're gonna ask you the Crohn's derivative, and for our conversation now, invariably it's gonna be related to something related to vitamins, okay? Bruising, et cetera, we'll get to it. All right, so we've beaten to death liver, we got bile acid synthesis, bile salt secretion, enteropatic circulation. All right, so exocrine failure of the pancreas. So really what we're talking about here is chronic pancreatitis, not acute pancreatitis, and really a failure of lipase. So what's the vignettes for pancreatitis? How are you gonna recognize it? And the main players for the boards, it's cystic fibrosis again, inspissated secretions, blocking ducts, you ultimately wind up with exocrine dysfunction, endocrine as well, but exocrine dysfunction in the pancreas. So how they describe the patient with cystic fibrosis? A youngster with recurrent respiratory infections, right? A youngster with recurrent pneumonia, and then they give you something else. Really, you should be thinking about cystic fibrosis. They may or may not include clubbing in that patient. The other uh, chronic pancreatitis player is the um, alcohol user. Repeated bouts of abdominal pain. Patient uses too much alcohol, has recurrent hospitalizations or ER visits for abdominal pain. That's the setup for the recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis. But how are they gonna get you across the finish line? They were seen with radio opacities in the mid-epigastrium. So mid-epigastric calcifications or opacities, that is the language of chronic pancreatitis. They need a disease to get you there, like alcohol use, or cystic fibrosis. And again, what's a calcium? Dystrophic calcification from an injured pancreas, right? Dystrophic calcification is great stuff. It's all over the damn place. And again, pay attention to opacities in the right upper quadrant, right? These are stones, I'll say something about that in a second, versus the mid-epigastrium with calcifications, it'll be the pancreas. If they talk about calcifications in the right upper quadrant, what kind of stones are those? Are those cholesterol stones, right? Cholesterol stones are radio uh, opaque. You don't see those. Radiolucent stones, right? What do you need for radiolucency? Calcium, right? So the calcium uh, bilirubinate stones related to hemolysis. Right, sickle cell, you pick your favorite hemolytic condition. In that case, you have bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia, gets calcified. Those are the radio opaque stones in the right upper quadrant. So um, diagnosis. So we had this whole setup in this patient with cystic fibrosis, alcohol, and or calcifications in the menopigastrium. How do you actually make the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis? The opacifications are great, the steatorrhea is great, but I still need to know it's coming from the pancreas. It's a secretin stimulation test. And I think we cover that, yeah, we're gonna cover that in GI, in fact, when we do the hormones. But just to let you know, again, they just cannulate the pancreatic duct, they give secretin, and what does the pancreas do? It makes the aqueous ductal cells make bicarb, right? So they give you secretin, how much bicarb is taken after you give IV secretin, and it tells you your pancreas works or it doesn't. If there's no bicarb in the secretions afterward, shit, man, your pancreas is done, right? Chronic pancreatitis, you fail the secretin stimulation test. You don't want to fail that test. All right, we knocked off the pancreas, we knocked off the liver, it looks like we're just left with the enterocyte. So again, we'll get to malabsorption also in GI, there's all overlap with these things, but the main malabsorptive conditions there after celiac disease, giardia, right, enterocyte failure, Whipple's disease, you never really see a question on that. Those are the enterocyte failure questions. So what I want to do is then get to the stigmata, and really it becomes the discussion about the fat-soluble vitamins. 